Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. Welcome to Crime Talk, where you can get the facts and an explanation regarding the legal issues and trial strategies of the cases that we discuss. Now, we have an excellent show planned for you today. We have some new orders from Judge Boyce in the Lori Vallow matter. Ghislaine Maxwell's sentencing may be continued, and wait until you hear the reason why. There may be an unusual development in the lawsuit between the parents of Gabby Petito and Brian Laundrie. There is no agreement between Amber Heard and Johnny Depp. Will there be an appeal? Hmm. And could Johnny Depp return to the role of Captain Jack Sparrow? An alleged co-conspirator in the Alec Murdoch case is behind bars once again. A little bit of more food violence. This one's actually quite tragic, not funny at all. And then Josh Duggar transported to the BOP, the Bureau of Prisons. And then finally, our dumb criminal of the day. Let's talk about it. All right, before we get to today's docket, let's hear a word from today's sponsor, Magic Mind. So lately I've been trying to cut back on my Red Bull intake because I feel like lately it's been a little more difficult to fall asleep. And if you've been a fan for a while, you know that I also don't drink coffee. So I've been trying these little bottles of Magic Mind. So if you're like me and you don't like the crashes and jitters that come from coffee and Red Bull, then you have to try out my new favorite caffeine hack, Magic Mind. I love that they are small and easy to transport. I usually drink them on the way to work in the morning, and by the time I'm at my desk, I am ready to take on whatever craziness the world is going to throw at me. Magic Mind also has ashwagandha in it, which works to decrease stress, which certainly I can use a little of. And I'm looking into stock in the fridge here with Magic Mind so that my whole team can feel the benefits. So they gave me a great discount code. All you have to do is go to magicmind.co and use the code CT40, that's short for Crime Talk 40, for 40% off your first subscription. Or if you aren't into that, you can get 20% off your first purchase. I'll leave the notes in the show link. And the best part is that they have a money back guarantee because you know it's always about the money. Go to www.magicmind.co backslash crime talk discount code CT40. Let's go ahead and open the docket for June 27th, 2022. Now, we have some new orders from Judge Boyce in the Lori Vallow matter. Now, Judge Boyce formally issued an order regarding the change of venue for Lori Vallow. As you may recall, these are separate cases within the judicial system, and well, the court has to make separate rulings because although the cases have been joined legally, technically, uh, the court still needs to do some procedural things. So we'll continue. The court provided some procedural history uh, by stating that on May 24th, 2021, a Fremont County grand jury returned an indictment charging defendants Chad Guy Daybell and Lori Vallow uh, with multiple crimes, including conspiracy to commit first degree murder and first degree murder. On May 27th of 2021, Judge Boyce entered an order staying the defendant's case, Lori Vallow's, uh, because of incompetency issues. And pursuant to the statute and uh, on the basis that the defendant had been deemed incompetent and subsequently ordered her to receive restoration treatment and care, uh, that was on June 28th. Mark Means, the previous counsel for Ms. Vallow, uh, filed a motion to transfer trial but pursuant to the stay of the case, the motion was never noticed for an actual hearing. So on August 6th of 2021, Judge Boyce entered an order clarifying that for purposes of conducting a jury trial, the case of Idaho v. Chad Daybell and cited the case number and the case of State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Vallow are currently joined. So during this time, the case was stayed for Lori Vallow. On July 7th of 2021, alleged co-conspirator Chad Guy Daybell, through his attorney, filed a motion for change of venue, which was argued on October 5th, 2021. On October 8th, 2021, the court issued a memorandum decision and order granting the motion, recommending a transfer of the trial to Ada County. And October 21st, 2021, the Idaho Supreme Court entered an order into Chad DeBell's case number, ordering the case to be transferred for purposes of trial only. 
Then on April 11th of 2022, this court entered an order lifting the stay of the case after determining that the defendant, Lori Noreen Vallow, had been restored to competency. And then on October 19th of 2022, the defendant was arraigned on the charge filed in the indictment entered on May 25th of 2021. Now, during that April 19th, 2022 hearing in Fremont County, the state of Idaho's motion to reconsider the court's prior decision to transfer the trial from Fremont County to Ada County, uh, James Archibald, in his capacity as appointed counsel for the defendant, Lori Vallow, was asked to advise the court regarding the previously filed motion to transfer and to clarify the defendant's position on the transfer of the trial. Mr. Archibald stated to the court and represented the defendant stated her expressed position was to have the jury selection and jury trial held in Ada County. Now, accordingly, then the defendant renewed her motion to transfer trial and joined in the objection of the state's motion to reconsider uh, the issue. Uh, Judge Boyce stated this issue was previously determined on the merits after a full hearing in the companion case, which was Chad DeBell's. And as a companion case involving co-conspirators, this court found that the issues previously determined on the issue of transfer of the trial mirror those in this case and the court here and adopts the previous conclusions as they relate to this case. Uh, Judge Boyce states that the order of this court in this case is to transfer the trial for Lori Vallow to the um, to the Supreme Court and pursuant to the applicable rules this court recommends that Judge Boyce continue his assignment over the case and be tried together in Ada County for both cases. Now, as I stated, Judge Boyce requested the Idaho Supreme Court to enter that order uh, so that the trial be transferred for Lori Vallow for the reasons stated above. Now, the other order memorialized the uh, court's trial date schedule. So this trial is supposed to begin for Lori Vallow and Chad Day Bell, and they have blocked out beginning on January 9th of 2023 and going through March 17th of 2023 to complete it. Now, obviously, jury selection may take a while, but if they do it correctly and efficiently, maybe a week at most, I think that can get done. So two months uh, to try this case, two and a half months, really, by the time you uh, take out the jury selection process. The court also ordered that basically Lori Vallow has to file any motions and they have to be filed in a timely fashion so that they can be heard on the motions hearing date of November 9th. Now, that date is also going to be a pretrial readiness conference. And on the day of that pretrial readiness conference, both parties have to be able to inform the court whether this case is going to trial, whether they're ready or not, or whether there's going to be another request for a continuance. The court also stated in this somewhat standard order that all plea agreements should be reduced to writing and obviously signed by all the attorneys and the defendant if there's going to be a plea agreement. And written notice has to be given 90 days in advance of trial if a party intends to raise the issue of mental condition and or expert witnesses concerning such issues of mental capacity. Plan on that notice being given, given the fact that Lori Vallow was deemed to be incompetent. I'm sure there were experts probably say that she's been in the state of where she wasn't competent and can truly appreciate what's taking place, which goes to the requisite mental state, probably dating back years. So we'll see. The court also says if there's going to be any motions to continue, they have to state the reason, um, and it must be in writing and accompanied by an order to vacate the trial and reset. Hopefully that will not be an issue. This case has gone on too long. It needs to be tried. And if there's going to be a request by the defense, you have to be prepared to waive speedy trial. Because no, I think that's already an issue in this case. And jury instructions have to be submitted by November 9th as well. Now, the last thing that the court does in this kind of general order states that the presiding judge intends to use a panel of judges as the alternates to preside at trial or any other hearings or proceedings. And it states that notice is given that there are multiple defendants. The presiding judge must determine whether the co-defendants have a sufficient interest uh, in common to be required to join any disqualification without, the co without cause or whether they have an adverse interest. As you may recall, apparently there's kind of a unique rule. I've never seen it before. But there in Idaho, basically, if you don't like the judge, you can basically disqualify them without cause for any reason. Um, I don't think that... Lori Vallow has previously already done that. I'd have to go back and double check, and I wasn't able to do that beforehand. But um, I don't think that'll take place. 
but you never know. This thing, there's always something that pops up and it always seems to delay the trial or we're gonna have a hearing where the rest of the public cannot see it. All right, before we get to Ghislaine Maxwell, remember, like the video if you do, subscribe if you have not, leave me a comment below. And remember, if you can't watch us, you can always listen to us anytime by downloading us on your favorite podcasting app. Okay, Ghislaine Maxwell, her sentencing may be continued. As you know, her sentencing is set for tomorrow. And as you may also recall, Ghislaine Maxwell was convicted back on December 29th of last year of sex trafficking related charges filed against her in Manhattan Federal District Court after she was alleged and the jury found beyond a reasonable doubt that she recruited girls, some as young as 14, for that guy named Jeff. Ghislaine Maxwell could be sentenced to the maximum penalty of up to 55 years in prison. Now, Ghislaine Maxwell's attorneys wrote a letter to the court in this case that uh, Ms. Maxwell would seek to postpone her sentencing Tuesday because she cannot properly prepare for the hearing. Now, prison officials on Friday took away Ms. Maxwell's legal papers along with her regular clothes, toothpaste and soap while putting her in solitary confinement and on suicide watch. Now, her attorneys argue that if Ms. Maxwell remains in suicide watch, uh, she is prohibited from reviewing legal matters before sentencing and has been sleep deprived and is denied sufficient time to meet with and confer with counsel and that they will formally be moving for a continuance at the appropriate time. Now, a psychologist has apparently evaluated Ms. Maxwell and concluded that she is in fact not suicidal. Federal prosecutors responded saying that Ms. Maxwell has been put on a suicide watch partly because she has reported to the jail's administration and facility staff that they were potentially threatening her safety, inmates and the staff apparently. The lockup staff put her on suicide watch to remove her from the facility's regular population while it investigated Ms. Maxwell's claims, also because she's a convicted now sex offender and they're generally at a higher risk of self-harm. Ms. Maxwell's lawyers also ask the judge to bar four accusers from providing victim impact statements at the sentencing hearing and um, it was tentatively scheduled for Tuesday, arguing that they were adults uh, when the alleged encounters occurred and therefore did not have the right to speak at the proceedings. Hmm, well, what will probably happen? Well, the court's not gonna tell the marshals how to run their detention center and who goes into suicide watch. Frankly, I'm not really sure what else Ms. Maxwell needs to review and prepare for prior to sentencing. The pre-sentence investigation report will have been completed. The attorneys would have submitted their objections to the report um, and the calculations under the uh, federal sentencing guidelines, although advisory are a starting point, um, which we've discussed in previous videos. And there will be an appeal and Ms. Maxwell should say nothing at her sentencing as anything she says can and will be used against her. This hearing should simply go forward. You can't have it both ways, Ms. Maxwell, of saying I want to uh, be protected, so to speak, from general population, but at the same time uh, say that you can't prepare for court. I don't know what else you need to be involved in. The case is gonna be appealed, you simply sit there. Now the issue about victims, the federal sentencing statutes are very, interesting as it relates to victims. I was at a federal sentencing just last week on a federal homicide case. And there were family members who wanted to speak, but they were not victims with under the statute. Now, it didn't really make much difference. We deferred to the court. The judge says, fine, I'll give mom five minutes and a dad or a brother uh, two minutes. And they were both very brief and eloquent and that was that. But the federal statute doesn't go into like state statutes where everybody's a victim and everybody can get up and talk at a state sentencing. So I'm sure the court will allow uh, everybody who is identified as a victim or maybe named in the charging documents to testify as a, uh, as a victim. Uh, but I wouldn't get too up, worked up about that at all. But sometimes when you got nothing, you gotta make a record. Like I said, I still think it's interesting in cases like this where Ghislaine Maxwell is the only one that has ever been charged other than that guy named Jeff. When there were allegedly so many people that went on that airplane, the Lolita Express, it still makes you kind of wonder if maybe there's justice for us, 
or maybe it's just justice for people that, you know, live in a whole different world. Let me know in the comments. A little bit of an interesting twist in the lawsuit between the parents of uh, Gabby Petito and Brian Laundrie. Now, a lawyer claims that Brian Laundrie's mother, Roberta Laundrie, wrote him a secret letter after he allegedly killed his fiance, Gabby Petito, where she offered to assist him. Now, attorney Patrick Riley, who's representing Petito's parents in the civil suit against the family, hinted that even the lawyer for Laundrie's parents, uh, Steve Bertolino, was surprised by this bombshell letter. Now, allegedly, within that letter is an offer from Roberto Laundrie to assist her son, according to the attorney. It's very interesting and pretty odd letter as he describes it. Now, for those who don't recall, Petito's parents, uh, Joseph Petito and Nicole Schmidt, have filed a lawsuit against Christopher and Roberta Laundrie in Florida court, accusing them of harboring Brian and conspiring to help him flee to avoid taking responsibility for his crime. Riley suggests that the letter could offer proof in regards to their claim for basically intentional infliction of emotional distress. I think the lawsuit is probably frivolous and will probably be disposed of at that time. Even if somebody writes a letter and saying, we will be there for you, we will put a, a file in a cake for you, uh, that just simply means I'll do anything for you. But it doesn't open yourself up to any liability until you actually act upon it. So Petito was reported missing, for those who don't recall, back in September, and uh, she and Laundrie embarked on a cross-country road trip. She was found strangled to death in September of 2021 near the Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming, and she had been deceased for three weeks. Brian Laundrie went on the run after her body was found and later discovered dead of a self-inflicted gunshot wound in the head uh, back in October. Now, the lawyer for Laundrie's parents recently released pages for his diary where he confessed to killing Miss Petito and claimed that it was merciful and what she wanted. On the outside of this alleged note, of the envelope, which was found in Petito's van, which the couple used on a cross-country road trip, Roberta Laundrie allegedly had written, burn after you read this, according to the attorney, Mr. Riley. There's no date on the letter, but it appears to have been written between the time that Gabby was murdered and Brian committed suicide, according to the attorney. There are scenarios presented by Roberta, for example, if you go to jail, I'll bake a cake and put a knife in it for you or a saw in it. He said that the evidence was gathered as part of the federal investigation into Gabby Petito's murder. And the attorney's understanding is that the letter at one point had been in the van, but that it was later taken from the laundry home during the time where they had executed search warrants. Now, the attorney for Petito's family declined to fully describe the correspondence, saying that he did not want to misquote it. He said that he thought he has read the letter. He doesn't have a copy of it but has requested it for the purposes of the lawsuit. So since he doesn't have a copy of the letter and he's not showing us a copy of it, color me a little skeptical on this one, ladies and gentlemen, we will just have to wait and see. I'm just not sure where the legal duty comes in for them, the Petito family, to sue the Laundry family. And don't get me wrong, I think they probably had a pretty good idea something was wrong and he wasn't coming home, so to speak, but I don't think there's a legal duty. We'll see. A lawsuit at the beginning in a civil case, the court has to look at the facts and deem them as true. And then the case proceeds from there. We'll see. The adversarial process is the best way to find the truth. All right, how about a little more Johnny Depp and Amber Heard? Well, Johnny Depp and Amber Heard failed to settle on Friday, raising the prospect of an appeal in their high profile defamation case. A representative for Ms. Heard suggested that she intends to appeal the verdict. She stated, you don't ask for a pardon if you're innocent, and you don't decline to appeal if you know you are right. Now, earlier in the month, as you may recall, a jury in Fairfax, Virginia, awarded Mr. Depp $15 million in damages after concluding that Ms. Heard libeled him in a newspaper opinion piece about alleged domestic violence. The court reduced the jury award to $10.35 million, which is a damage limit imposed by state law. The jury also found that a former lawyer for Depp had defamed Ms. Heard and awarded her $2 million in damages. And one of Depp's lawyers had previously said that Depp might have been willing to settle without requiring that Heard pay any damages if she stipulated not to appeal the verdict. We obviously can't disclose attorney-client communications, but 
as Mr. Depp has testified, this was never about the money, according to Mr. Depp. Not about the money for Mr. Depp, according to the attorney, Mr. Benjamin Chu. Now, a lawyer for Ms. Heard has said that she does not have the funds to pay the judgment, which is effectively $8.35 million, when accounting for the $2 million offset uh, for the damages imposed by Mr. Depp. Now, she has to post an appeal bond. That's expensive. She's got to buy all those transcripts. The appellate attorneys are going to have to go through and draft that. It's going to be expensive. And guess what? Even if you're going to post the appeal bond, which says, yes, I'm serious about appealing this case, the interest accrues on this, which is usually set by a statutory rate of anywhere between 6.5 and 8% uh, interest. And it goes back until the date of the alleged libelous act as it continues until it's paid. So things are getting expensive. We'll see how serious um, Ms. Hurd is about this. Now, Johnny Depp, on the other hand, apparently is coming out of this quite well. It's rumored that he may be getting paid more than $300 million to return to Pirates of the Caribbean after getting in unceremoniously dumped. Johnny Depp is rumored to be getting paid more than $300 million to return to the Pirates of the Caribbean after being unceremoniously dumped uh, from the uh, franchise back in 2018 amid the allegations of abuse leveled by Miss Heard. Now that's apparently coming from a source from Disney who said they're in talks. We'll see. Some people say Johnny's not going to take the money, but hey, $300 million? It's always about the money, ladies and gentlemen. Next, Alex Murdoch. Okay, take a look at this guy. Curtis Eddie Smith. Well, he was arrested Friday evening and brought to the Colton County Detention Center in South Carolina, where he's being held on warrants from the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, which is known as SLED. Now, Mr. Smith is facing additional charges for financial crimes, including money laundering. The charges are tied to the ongoing investigation into Alec Murdoch's alleged financial schemes. Now, Mr. Murdoch faces 83 charges, most of which are connected to the alleged theft of more than $8.4 million from clients uh, from his former law firm. Now, why could he be getting in trouble? Well, it's alleged that between March of 2015 and June of 2021, Mr. Smith allegedly cashed more than $1.8 million in checks from Mr. Murdoch. The checks were typically written in increments of less than $10,000. The threshold set by the Bank Secrecy Act which requires banks to file suspicious activity reports for anyone filing uh, or depositing or cashing checks of $10,000 or more. So beginning in February 2021, however, the amount of the checks increased substantially, more times breaching the reporting threshold. Now you may be saying, Scott, why does Mr. Smith's name sound familiar in this Alec Murdoch matter? Well, Mr. Smith was the first person arrested in the Murdoch case even before Mr. Murdoch. That was over Labor Day weekend when Mr. Murdoch called 911 claiming to be have been shot by a white man in a passing vehicle when he was stopping to fix a flat tire on the side of a road. But it quickly became apparent that Murdoch's story had some holes in it. And then on September 14th, Smith was arrested after Murdoch and his attorneys identified him as the person Murdoch hired to kill him. Murdoch's alleged plan was to stage a murder so that his surviving son Buster could cash in on the $10 million insurance policy. Now, according to the attorneys for Mr. Murdoch, a longtime personal injury attorney, didn't realize his policy's suicide exclusion clause had expired. So immediately after the shooting, Mr. Murdoch told the uh, public that he had a 20-year uh, addiction to opioids and his attorneys repeatedly identified Mr. Smith as his longtime drug dealer, which Mr. Smith has denied publicly. Now, Mr. Smith was charged with assisted suicide, assault, and battery of a high and aggravated nature, pointing and presenting a firearm, insurance fraud, and conspiracy to commit insurance fraud in connection with that shooting. He's also facing two unrelated drug charges, distribution of methamphetamine, and possession of marijuana. After the shooting, Mr. Smith went on national TV to deny that he tried to kill Mr. Murdoch and told uh, everyone publicly that he is trying to wrestle the gun away from Mr. Murdoch when it went off. A preliminary hearing has not yet been set on Mr. Smith's case. Josh Duggar, that's right. Well, he has been whisked off 
from the Washington County Detention Center there in Arkansas, and he is on his way to the Bureau of Prisons. That's right, BOP. Now, Dunger, a former reality TV star, was found guilty on two child pornography charges in December of 2021 and was sentenced to 151 months in federal prison on May 25th in the Western District of Arkansas in their federal court in Fayetteville. Dugger had been held at the Washington County Jail since the day of his conviction. The transfer destination was not announced, but Dugger was removed from the county inmate roster. Dugger's attorneys requested at sentencing that he be sent to the Federal Correctional Institute, FCI, in either Texarkana or Segoville. I'm sorry I mispronounced that, due to their proximity to his family. But the judge noted that uh, he'd recommend the Segoville uh, facility if they had space due to the high-end treatment program for sex offenders. Now, security reasons dictate that BOP or other correctional facilities don't publicize when and where people will be going. Obviously, we can't have people try to break people out. So on June uh, 23rd, Duggar's wife, uh, Anna Duggar, uh, stated that she was on a road trip. She was road tripping it to visit my bestie in a social media post. She also noted that it was the 14th anniversary of his accepting Duggar's marriage proposal. You just can't separate true love, ladies and gentlemen. You just can't separate true love. All right, more food violence. A customer at the Subway store in Atlanta was uh, shot dead um, and one female worker injured after a customer complained that there was too much mayonnaise put on their sandwich. The shooting took place at a Circle K gas station on Northside Drive at about 6.30 p.m. on Sunday. The two victims, both women, were found after police arrived on the scene. One of them was immediately rushed to the hospital for surgery. Her condition remains unknown. The suspect is believed to be on the lam as of Monday. No identities of either the suspect or of the victims have been released, and it's unclear if the shooter is a man or a woman. The store owner said that the son of the employee who had been gunned down was inside the store at the time of the shooting. And I've never heard of the hold the mayo defense, okay? It's not a valid defense. You can't shoot people, ladies and gentlemen, because you don't like the way your sandwich is prepared, whether they put too much mayo on. Are you kidding me? Now, I don't know who did this. We'll give them the presumption of innocence, but really, you just cannot do this over a sandwich. Not even the sandwich. The condiments that were going on in the sandwich. Unbelievable. And then finally, our dumb criminal of the day, an Alabama man wearing a t-shirt proclaiming, I'm too good for drugs. He was arrested for possession of methamphetamines and some narcotic paraphernalia. Now, Mr. Burnett was collared Thursday night near his home in Asheville, which is a small city about 45 miles from Birmingham, Alabama. Mr. Burnett uh, was charged with a pair of drug counts and booked into the St. Clair County Jail. He was released early uh, in the morning after posting a $3,500 bond. All right. I hope you enjoyed the show, ladies and gentlemen. That was a big docket. Um, let's go ahead and close the docket for today, and we'll see you next time on Crime Talk. Crime Talk.